Hi, in this video we're going to take a look at the material conditional rules in Fitch. Let's take a look at them. Informally speaking, a material conditional asserts that the antecedent of the conditional being true guarantees the consequent to be true. So one rule that falls out of that assertion is that if we have a material conditional and if we also have its, ante its antecedent individually, we can infer its consequent. So if it's true that P guarantees Q and then you find out that you've got P, there's no way for you to have not gotten Q because we've already assumed that it's true that P would guarantee Q. So that's one rule that we can get <clears throat> that we get from what's being inserted in a material conditional. We also get a second one. If I can show you that from the assumption P that Q eventually follows. So a valid set of inferences from the assumption of P to Q, given whatever else we get to accept to be true. Then I have shown you that if P, then Q. That is, Q really does follow from P. And so as a result, I can infer the conditional if P, then Q, where the antecedent is going to correspond to the assumption that was introduced and the consequent corresponds to the um, inference that we eventually made or got to from assuming P. So now let's take a look at these formally. So the first rule that we were talking about is called conditional elimination in Fitch style system. It also has a Latin name because it's such a common way of arguing, modus ponens. And what it tells us is if you are giving both if P then Q and P, then the inference to Q is legitimate. And that's just what this diagram is here. It tells us that if somewhere in our proof we get to accept if P then Q as being true and we get to accept P as being true, we can infer Q. To apply the rule correctly at the point of inference or the, the step in which we are making the inference, we need to select conditional elimination we need to cite the conditional statement that we're relying on. And then we need to uh, cite the step that satisfies the antecedent or corresponds to the antecedent of the material conditional in question. All right, so now let's take a look at conditional introduction. All right, so conditional introduction what's also known as conditional proof tells us that if from an assumption P we succeed in proving Q so through a series of valid inferences then we can discharge our assumption and, inf and infer if P then Q and that's because to assume P and then get Q just is if P then Q just is the same thing. All right, so that is what this diagram diagrams for us. If we can succeed at some point in our proof in assuming P, then inferring Q, then we have 
demonstrated and therefore can infer if P then Q. To cite it correctly, we have to use conditional introduction, and then we cite the entire subproof that moves from P to Q. All right, so some helpful tips when doing conditional introduction. It's very helpful to work backwards. And one of the things that you're looking for while working backwards to see if you have a conditional that doesn't obviously follow. And if you do, a good strategy to try out then is assuming the antecedent of that conditional. So we spot the conditional down here. Then we say, well, it's not obvious how that's going to follow. Like it's not a conjunct of a conjunction or something of that sort. So I'll try assuming the antecedent and then see if I can derive the consequent. And if I can, then I can infer the conditional in question. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you've already proved certain things up here to be true, you can use reiterate to pull them down into the subproof and thereby inferring the conditional, uh, which you might need to do for an exercise, one of our exercises. All right, so let's take a look at these two rules. Um, in the Fitch computer program, so you have a sense about how to do them. All right, so in this argument, we have two premises. Our first premise says that if A is the same shape as C, then C is large. And our second premise is that A is the same shape as C. So that takes the form of if P then Q, P therefore Q. And that lets us know that we can do conditional elimination. I need to cite the two steps that take the form if P then Q, P. And then infer Q. Let's take a look at a little bit more complicated example. All right, in this argument, one of our premises says that if either B is small or D is large, then both D is larger than B and B is smaller than D. Our second premise says that D is large. I can see that because D is large is true, that the antecedent of this material conditional is true, because the antecedent of the material conditional is a disjunction. But I don't have a rule that allows me to move directly from 1 and 2 to the consequent of 1. That is, both D is larger than B and B is smaller than D. I have to make um, I have to infer a proposition that mirrors the antecedent completely. Turns out I can do so from premise uh, 2. Since D being large makes the antecedent true, I can use disjunction introduction since D is large, figures as one of the disjuncts in that disjunction. And now, step three, the proposition there, 
mirrors the antecedent entirely now. So notice it doesn't matter that it's a complex sentence that the antecedent of the material conditional is a complex sentence and that the consequent is also a complex sentence. It still takes the form, uh, one step one and step three still takes the form if p then q, p, and as a result, I'm going to be able to infer q. All right, now let's turn to taking a look at conditional introduction. All right, so here we see that we are wanting to prove if P then Q. So working backwards from that, I know that I want an assumption P and then I want to prove Q. Well, since Q is our premise, of course, it's got to be true. I just need to reiterate it so that it's within the subproof. And now I have proven from the assumption P, Q. So I can discharge back into the regular proof. I come to conditional introduction and I cite the proof, the subproof in which I prove that Q does follow from P. And we see that I can infer if P then Q, and I have proven my goal. Let's look at a slightly more complicated instance of conditional introduction. All right, so in this argument, we have a conditional statement that for the antecedent is a disjunction and for its consequent is a disjunction. So it says, if either A is a tetrahedron or F is happy, then either it's not the case that E is happy or B is small. So working backwards from this conditional statement, I know that I'm going to want to, or that I'm going to have to, assume the antecedent. And next, I now know that I have to infer the consequent. Well, looking at the consequent and looking at my premise, I see that B is small is one of the disjuncts of the consequent. Therefore, the consequent must be true given that the premise is true. And I, I know that because it's inferring a disjunction, I can do so through disjunction introduction. All right, so now that I have the antecedent assumed and I was able to infer the consequent, I'm going to be able to use conditional introduction, citing the entire proof that took moving from the assumption to the consequent, and then I can refer the conclusion. So notice that it doesn't matter that the antecedent is a complex sentence and that the consequent is a complex sentence. We can still use conditional introduction to uh, introduce a conditional statement where we have a complex sentence for the antecedent and we have a complex sentence for the consequent.